Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started with the life cycle of community. Again, um, Leslie Hawthorne, unfortunately, um, is not going to be able to join us today as she did fall ill, but um, I will welcome my partner in crime, um, Amy Marish, and myself, Cara Delia, both Red Hatters. Um, I actually sit on Leslie's team, and so Leslie looks after the vertical communities within our OSPO at Red Hat. We sit in the um, office of the CTO. I focus on uh, finding Financial services and sustainability focused around climate change um, as opposed to community sustainability. So um, just want to go ahead and talk about some of the experiences starting with uh, myself building community and and then uh, Amy's experience really living and breathing in an established community. So the community that I started um, as a community manager was OS Climate. I think you've heard a lot about OS Climate today. Um, o OS Climate is an open source project that was welcomed into the Linux Foundation last August uh, of 2021. And it is focused on open source tools around um, sustainable finance. Uh, Red Hat's contribution to this project is a data commons platform. And what that allows is data ingestion from public data sources and proprietary data sources, predominantly through a data vault if it is pr from a proprietary standpoint. Um, I will go ahead and apologize. If you are a visual learner, there are not many slides today. <laughs> so this will be conversation-based focused. Um, so one of the things that was unique about OS Climate is that um, I was bringing together a disparate group of stakeholders and that many of them were technical, and but the predominant were non-technical and they were also dealing in the financial services space very regulated as you can imagine. So open source readiness, which is something that we focus heavily on within the Red Hat OSPO, was an area of being help, being able to help them understand um, what the value of open source is. And so I always like to open, Gab, um, if you haven't met Gabriele Calumbro, who is now the leader of LF Europe, he is amazing, very passionate about open source. And I always like to share this quote from him, um, and that is around the open source being a strategic tool to drive innovation. And especially within financial services, uh, innovation is, while it might not necessarily seem to be the most interesting, it is a, a predominant driver, especially on the consumer side. If you want to go to the next slide. So the evolution of community engagement, and that is around you know being able to get your those disparate sources, have finding your key strategic partners. So one of the things within our OSPO, I talked to customers, I've talked actually to, to many customers um, out in, in Dublin this week. I've been very fortunate to meet them face to face instead of just a tiny little square on a Zoom call. But um, but helping them to understand that the obviously developers are going to be their key technical stakeholder, but the ecosystem of uh, stakeholder management within OSPOs or within open source is the, the non-technical side as well. Obviously code gets us there, but it is through the amplification of that code um, and the good work that the projects are doing that we're able to, to share, that, share that vision. And so um, I like to mention it as, you know, if a tree falls in the woods and you've created this beautiful piece of code, who's gonna know it? So, so that's where you need to get in, you know, your marketers, your brand, and, but very much your legal and compliance. Um, to make sure that you are, you know, obviously not taking on any unnecessary risk. Um, and, but the, these are key stakeholders in building community, while it might be from the, the ancillary piece, not within the actual day-to-day -day of a community. Um, it is kind of that halo around the community. Next slide, please. Um, and one of the other pieces that I talk to our customers about a lot is the value of OSPOs. Um, obviously, we've heard a lot from um, the to-do group and, um, and, and folks uh, here during, during OSPOCon. Um, OSPOs are truly the next phase. I mean, Google was and AWS certainly were um, you know, uh, 
kind of the frontier folk <laughs> of, of OSPO land. And now what we're seeing within you know, the, the horizon is that OSPOs and, and inner source are, usually it starts with inner source and then um, helps to feed into the larger OSPO strategy are becoming more and more. And uh, this is heavily for industry. And one of the other areas that I'm seeing this, especially in um, Europe, is around the public sector, so OSPOs within government. Um, there's going to be a, a lot of conversations in Bordeaux later this week. Um, I guess this is Thursday, so tomorrow. <laughs> Time is a little relative at the moment, but um, tomorrow and over the weekend, they're going to be talking about you know what does OSPO in the public sector in government actually um, look like, and how can we use the the common um, principles of of open source around collaboration innovation to be able to leverage that we actually within government and I like to think um, that also this is going to help um, with sustainability goals with climate change to be able to co-create for getting to net zero that much faster um, so I think there are a lot of challenges in open source from um, optics standpoint. You know, within this group, we are within this uh, conference. I think we also see the values. But I like to always have, and, and maybe it is just because I deal with financial services, and usually it's the risks and the um, blockers are that the first question. So helping to bring people on for realizing that even though there might be silo teams. There might be technical debt, you know, being able to showcase that these challenges up here are actually going to be able to be mitigated through open source. Um, I don't know if you anyone had the opportunity to hear Martin Sweeney and the folks from IBM talking about Linux One, um, and, and IBM is our parent co uh, company, but uh, the uh, the risks and security vulnerabilities that do come about. Um, within open source are, are easy to, or not easy, but they are easy to at least answer and be able to identify what does that um, supply chain look like. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so in kind of parting, you know, sustaining communities and their innovations, I'm certainly a, an advocate of open source and, um, you know, the sustainable communities, I think, do have more of a, a motivator, especially now with um, the climate crisis. With, and, um, and this is going to be able, or the focus here is to move beyond just the day-to-day -day and the, the short-term mindset to really that larger strategy. Next slide, I think that. Thank you. I'm going to hand it over to Amy. So I didn't really talk much about OMS climate. If you do have questions about OS climate, absolutely find me through here find me on LinkedIn um, and because I did start the community but really I would like Amy to give her um, her tech or her knowledge around uh, the communities that she works in that are much more established right so we decided we would start with how to start a new community and then I'm gonna go into an established community and a changing community so the established community I'm involved in is OpenStack OpenStack is not dead, y'all. We have over 40 million cores out there, but we're no longer the hype cycle. Um, Terry Kerez presented yesterday and actually pointed out we have the same number of contributions as Kubernetes. But y'all think Kubernetes is the hotness. So just something to keep in mind. Um, we do also, as the technical committee, meet with the Kubernetes steering committee. We all have the same challenges of getting people involved finding developers, finding code contributors, um, finding documentators. So all communities, no matter where they are in their hype cycle, do have some of the same challenges. So it's important to still be out there talking about your project and just talking to people, coming to conferences, giving talks on them, and just spreading you know, that you do exist. Um, Kara kind of mentioned governance. Make sure your governance is in place and it's solid. Um, even an established project uses legal. Um, in the case of OpenStack, we name all our releases. And we had a big discussion about going to numbers, and I'm like, no. You want to put num numbers in the code? That's fine. Marketing. 
and for community aspects, the name is so good because if you ask me what version of OpenStack I started on, I'm not going to tell you it was 2001, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to say, I started on Grizzly. You ask someone else, they're going to go, I started on Mitaka. The name is so important in holding your community together. And the strict developers didn't quite get that. So we handed naming back to the foundation to take care of. They went through legal to get the names before we voted on. And we're going to be Antelope. Why we're not Aardvark? I can't tell you why Aardvark did not pass legal. I also, I knew we were not going to get Yoda. We got yoga. But I wanted Yo Yoda so badly. You know, so sometimes, you know, you're still going to use legal no matter where you are in your life cycle. Um, so the established community, you have your contributors. And you're going to lose contributors because they want to try something new. A lot of them come back if they really love the community. Um, I like to call OpenStack a family. And it's a family we get together a couple times a year. And we just like slip into that relationship, whether it's virtual or in person. You hang out with your crew. You see someone who's alone, you invite them to your crew. Because that's a strong community. And it doesn't matter that it's not the new hotness. Because y'all are family. Um, so going into a changing community, I'm involved with CentOS. Ooh, CentOS. Um, yes, we did change where we are. We did change what we're releasing. So we're no longer a repackaging of RHEL. We now lie between Fedora and RHEL. Now, the great thing about this is that you can now contribute to CentOS. Now, we do admit that Stream 8 has some workflow issues. And when everyone complains about Stream, they're really complaining about 8. We have fixed or are really fixing the workflow in 9 so that you can become involved. So we met as a board at DevConf for our first face-to-face -face in a while. And one of our number one action item is onboarding documentation. Because it doesn't matter where you are in your process. If you do not have good onboarding documentation, you're not going to get new contributors. So revamping the website, onboarding docs, things you wouldn't think an established project needs, but very, very important. I mean, even in OpenStack, we go through all everything occasionally and make sure that the workflows still work. Do I set up my memberships and accounts and the software? Does that still work? And over time, it doesn't because OpenStack changed from OpenStack Foundation to Open Infrast Foundation. So things changed on their location. So we had to update all our documentation. So keeping up with your community, even if it's established, is very, very important to make sure that you as a leader are making the right decisions from a technical aspect as well as an overall aspect. So one thing we didn't get into, or not, or maybe just touched on with the mention of Finos, is a foundation versus a foundation in your project. OpenStack started with the OpenStack Foundation quickly after. So there's a board of directors that comes from sponsoring companies as well as the community. So we get nominated. We have to get 10 nominations before we even go on the ballot to become a board member. De December and January, very stressful. <laughs> you just cross your fingers that people recognized how much work you did. Um, so we do budgeting for the foundation. I mean, we're very hands-on with the money and the decisions. And more, some board members are more active than others. Um, but sent to Wes on the other side is a Red Hat project. We have events, but we don't have the visibility into that budget. Um, we are now doing open board meetings. You do have to get invited, but it's open for any members of the community, and that's new for them. So I'm trying to bring in open infras for opens to a different community to get them more open. We do not refer to the RHEL developers and the community. Everybody's a contributor. And you have to stress that with both sides because it's not an us and them in your community. It's an us. How are we doing on time? OK. So some other things that when you have a more established community, marketing is important, 
onboarding, legal, all, all things that are mentioned, but also just double checking and checking in with your community throughout the year. Is everyone doing okay? Especially at these times, making sure you're not burning out your developers. Um, OpenStack is a little different in because it has a main project, but then lots of projects within it. So even checking you know, at the time of elections, do we have leadership for that other project? Can we find a volunteer? Do we need to retire that project? What would the, be the impact of retiring that project within, within the larger project? So always keeping an eye on what's going on within all aspects of a community from a technical po point is important, but also from a community aspect. Is there anything you want to add? So I think in closing, because I definitely want to open it up for some questions, but you know, I think too in what Amy was saying is the contribution piece is 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 super key, especially in a new community, and especially with a community that might not necessarily be technical first, and so that clear documentation is one thousand percent in the governance piece as well. Anytime you are also dealing with data, is having a clear data policy and understanding your data lineage, understanding your, um, your ingestion pipeline. Um, in addition to is being inclusive. I think that community engagement piece is so much, is so key because so much time now you hear of imposter syndrome. My background, not technical. Um, I mean, I have understandings of concepts, but it's not technical. And it's many times I've talked with my peers and they're saying, well, I can't contribute to an open source project. And so it's really as a community member and as a community manager, it is to understand, to, to be able to um, broaden your community, is to be able to include a multitude of types of contributors to your to to your community, and that key of checking in so important. Truly, these in, in these times, and I know that was one thing Leslie did want to say is that during the crisis, it's it, you know community engagement is super critical. So, did you have any? So your contributors aren't just code, documentation, meetup leaders. So it's important that you include all of them and still call them contributors. Because those are also the best way to get new people into your community. They might go to a meetup. They might volunteer to lead that meetup next time. Well, hey, there's something wrong with the documentation. Let me fix that. You know, this is kind of cool. I want to learn how to code that. I can make this one change. It'll take me two seconds. And you get them hooked. They want to do more because they like the community. They like what you're doing. And it all started from going to a meetup. And as far as imposter syndrome, one of the most technical people I know who you would think would never suffer from it gave an imposter syndrome talk. And then it was like, wow, if he's got imposter syndrome, oh my God. So then you're now standing up and giving talks because you notice that if someone, if you didn't do it, maybe no one else would. So those are all important things on growing your leadership as well, encouraging person to do one thing, then it grows from there. Anything else? I was just going to say I think that's a great point and opening it up for questions or concerns. Sure, and the question is uh, being able to uh, attract more of a 
beyond the newcomer, so being able to attract um, someone that would be advanced the, into your community. I will say from OS Climate um, perspective, it was working with the uh, the business leaders that were contri or that were essentially the paying members of the project to be able to essentially give them a sales pitch. This is the value, give contribute or convey this value back. Um, and in many ways in other communities I'm a part of, not just OS Climate, it is cre it's creating that value statement for them and letting them know that they, that they would really be of value to this project. I mean, who doesn't want to be of value? And so being able to convey that is a key piece um, and clearly. Yeah, kind of the same thing from the very early days of the OpenStack Foundation, Platinum members had to contribute full-time equivalents. So if you wanted to be a Platinum member, you had to bring an employee or two, a developer or two generally. Um, but if there's people that you have targeted, ask them. It's such a compliment for you to go up to and go, hey, I know you have a similar interest in this. I think you could bring so much value whether you can bring code, if you can mentor someone else, because mentoring will help bring those newcomers up and they'll bring them up quicker. And sometimes it goes back to that imposter syndrome thing. Maybe they don't realize they're that person you're looking for. So they don't even think to volunteer or to come join. Yeah, they're interested in it, but you know, yeah, what's one more line of code gonna be? But they're gonna bring something beyond that one line of code. Yes. So, <laughs> so for the audience, what I um, was saying is that it is it, from the first approach with when you have the business buy-in, it is going to be easier for the um, to get on the docket <laughs> essentially or get on the meeting calendar for that developer because obviously there is um, known value there. Would you say that's a fair? Okay. So the other piece is, um, so it's contributing or sharing the value and then it is instead of boiling the ocean, it's giving them the one thing that you really need them to do immediately. And um, so in, o in OS Climate, what I would do is I would um, work with the different work streams and identify the one thing that needed to be, um, that was a real crucial area of need. And within the next, you know, one to three months, and typically it would take about a month to get someone to do that so it was being able to identify that with the work streams but then the next step is identifying what that is and having an office hours or open source readiness hours is what I called them to be able to bring those different people together and it was a quite small group explaining the value of the you know just high level never more than 15 minutes to a half an hour because everyone has a busy day um, and just being as concise as, pos as possible. And, um, and a lot of times that would have to be an iterative process. And, um, and in addition to that, uh, the, is making sure that within the contributor guidelines that I was sharing that. So it wasn't just I had to have a meeting with someone, that this was asynchronous, asynchronously um, accomplished as well, either through a pull request or through um, a HackMD file. And as far as you know, getting someone who's very busy to participate, um, one thing we've learned from having community events where we were onboarding people, but we'd ask questions to make sure people were listening, a sticker would get someone to answer. A cookie would get someone to answer. There was a really good talk on Monday during the Chaos Con, which will be available on um, YouTube, about badging. So sometimes that teeny tiny little reward that you wouldn't think would make a difference will get 10 minutes of that person's time in order to look at your issue and then they'll say, oh, that'll take me a second. You know, so something just a little reward to get participation is enough to get someone who's more experienced in. Because you're all the way back here. 
So my question is, what kind of meetings recommend? You mentioned already office hours. Uh, like in my project, we have basically developer meeting, but now we see a need for, okay, how do we do onboarding? We have governance meetings. So what kind of like typical meetings would you kind of recommend a project has for doing onboarding the, the developers and all that other stuff? So one thing OpenStack has done, and like I mentioned, we need to work on CentOS's onboarding, so I'm not going to discuss it because that's all a work in progress, is at events we would hold what we called Upstream Institute. Day and a half, we would teach you governance. We would help you set up your machines. Um, so it was a commitment for you to come to a conference early, but we were going to help you through everything you needed to get started. Um, we have really good step-by-step -step documentation on onboarding. We hold a SIG meeting. Um, so there's lots of things you can do virtually online. Um, when we had virtual conferences, we would still have a setup session. Um, it's a little harder because you can't walk over to someone's machine and see the error they have. But we'd have enough people that if we needed to break them out into different rooms and share screens, we could do it. Um, but it all depends on the tool set you're using. OpenStack is one of the few projects that use Garrett. I love Garrett. I think it's easier to get patches and commits in. I suck at pull requests. I mean, you would think I'd never contributed to an open source project when I do a pull request and then I have to squash a million and one because I'm used to just patching on top of patching. Um, so an understanding of your tool set and how to use them is important and it should be documented. Um, we did try to do videos, but by the time we do the videos and get them finished, they were out of date. Um, so I think trying, whether it's virtual in person, to have you know onboarding at events is very important. So with OS Climate, um, when I had the weekly office hours, and that was more for folks that had just general questions. Um, monthly all hands meetings, and that was more a, a opportunity to give the feedback of what was happening on the board level, um, on the technical steering com uh, committee level, and uh, from the project work streams. But to get that engagement piece, I did have um, by by monthly, so twice a month. <laughs> I always want to say bi weekly, it was not twice a week. Um, Two times a month, I had um, open source readiness, or I had um, just project readiness sessions for anyone that had any kind of general questions. But then I had um, deliberate half hour, um, and this was weekly, office hours for contributing. And um, a lot of times what I actually would do is go after the contributor because, and that was, uh, folks that had been identified that they wanted to be in the, um, that they wanted to have to be a part of the project. So I would, I, I would have it be where it was almost a one-on-one -on -one with us. And I would have um, one-on-ones with a lot of folks um, where pe because people didn't want to necessarily uh, feel like they didn't have the right answer in a group setting. Yes, in the back. I think that's a great point. And so for the audience, it's um, the recommendation and wonderful uh, concept is to actually refer to office hours as drop-in hours so that it is um, more inviting to be able to ask the questions. And I think the perception is with office hours is that you are going with an issue already and sometimes you don't even know the issue or the question that you need to ask and um, and so I think too that would probably help the types of, and also the other piece of that is that the drop-in hours um, could uh, be more inclusive for folks that might not um, feel like that the contributors that might not be asking the questions and that have very valid questions within the community. 
Now, not necessarily meeting related, but your mention of Twitter brought this up to my mind. One thing we found with the OpenStack operators is they weren't getting the messages that were tagged for them on our mailing lists. But we found out that they were reading Twitter. So we made a Twitter account. So whenever we want to send something for like at the ops meetups, we send it via Twitter and we get responses. So know where your audience resides and the best way to contact them. And one, I absolutely, 100% agree with that. And the other piece is, is just ask the community. That was one thing. So I wouldn't have normally chosen to have my um, calendar filled with all these meetings. But one of the reasons why I did have it is that the, I was asking the community, and also it was a global community, or is a global community. And so, you know, my time zone might not be someone else's time zone. And so um, being able to have the asynchronous part is important. But it is just asking, what are your preferred methods so that you are where the, the um, you're, you're bringing the content, you're, you know, you're bringing the information to where the audience is able to consume it. Any other questions? Well, with that, I want to thank you all for your time and space for spending time with us and um, hope you have a, a great rest of the conference. And again, we are down at the Red Hat booth. This is Amy Marish, Cara Delia, signing off. <laughs>